Welcome to this podcast, Holistic Creators, where we share our unique and universal stories about shaping the future for the four Ps, people, planet, purpose, and profit. My name is Manet Kunze. I'm a mental coach and your host of this show. My intention for this show is to inspire you on your path to a holistic future. So welcome. Hello and welcome to my podcast, Holistic Creators. My name is Manet and I'm your host. Today, my guest is Jennifer Huff. She is an international best-selling author and a master of the physics of flow. So welcome to my show. So happy to be here, Swanette. I'm excited to have this conversation. Yeah, and me as well. And I'm super curious because you are very special and we will figure out what is so different from other people and what is so special about you in this conversation that we will now have. Well, it takes one to know one, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> So, and um, I have read about your your prayer interview form, and you said, "Why is it that we haven't learned this in school? What I know now, and this is what I want to start with. Like you are very uh, educated in different fields, but you also are an intuitive, and right. yeah, you, you you kind of invented yourself several times. Let's hear about that. I did." Um... I did. First of all, I, I would say there's probably three significant times in my life where I realized, hey, wait a second, I have questions and the world does not have answers. <laughs> and these questions would be, w would change my life if I knew the answers to them. So one of them was when I was little, when I was seven years old, I had an eye operation. And during that eye operation, what happened was I... Uh, I knew that I didn't fit in. You know, I had a patch over my eye. I was only in grade two. And, you know, everybody in in school, I was always taller than everybody else as well. And um, I thought, well, wait a second now. I have, I, I'm not like everybody else. I don't fit in. Now, I know lots of other people feel this way. And I walked around physically that way. You know, here I am. I'm very... Uh, I, I kind of stick out. And why would the world, why would life do this? And does life do this to you? And where does this come from? And why do we have different paths? And why do we all look different? So I had all these questions. So uh, then I noticed I was different because when I was being confirmed in church, my uh, the the minister who was doing the confirmation, he was speaking things like he had memorized them. And I was looking for some answers, and I got very angry um, that he wasn't really thinking about what he was saying. I really wanted to know what God was, you know. So a little weird, a little weird for 12 years old, but still curious as anything. And my answer came a few years later, um, or at least the doorway to some answers came a few years later when I was blessed in the end of high school with this fabulous physics teacher who came from Nigeria. He was this big round dude. I mean, he was literally round and he couldn't, he couldn't teach at university in Canada. Um, even though he was a PhD professor because he was from Nigeria and he would have had to go through a few tests or whatever, whatever. But I didn't care because I was happy that he ended up in my high school and we had, he called me Huffy and uh, we had some great conversations about physics. I was asking him about, you know, conservation of energy theory, um, given that when the body is over, there's something that's running the body, which, you know, I didn't have language for it back then, but he said, well, it has to go somewhere. It's the energy that runs your body. So it has to go somewhere. And then finally I went, ah, science might have some answers. So um, those were some pretty formative things in my earlier years. The formative things of my later years had to do with um, three near death experiences including one with meningitis where where pretty miraculous things happened and I couldn't have explained them one of which was my ex-husband and my boyfriend I woke up from a coma 
And I opened my eyes and my ex-boyfriend and my husband were on either side of me holding my hands. And I thought I died and went to heaven. <laughs> so, so I knew that things could be orchestrated. I mean, it's, it's a very profound thing to awaken to. And I had a feeling that the love of both of them is what woke me up. So one on either side. And I'm like, why did, how, why did that happen? So these are the, these are, these are, were the questions that, that kind of drove me in my life. What is God? Who am I? Why do things happen the way they happen? Is there a greater order? Can I play with that? Do I have the power to actually, um, be involved in that alchemy and uh that's where that's kind of how it started um a few other things but i would say those are the main ones when it mm -hmm. and i totally can relate to that because yeah i i kind of had the same experience like no i had a near-death experience when i was eight years old and also like this kind of feeling that there is this duality like on the one hand there's a body and there on the other hand there's a spirit and I was really looking at myself uh, being in a hospital and I could see like all the treatments the doctors did with me while I was in coma. And it was like, okay, I know that there is something else than just me being like this carbon-based body. Right. And yeah, there, there was this curiosity as well, as you described it. Now, what, what is life about and questions coming up why am i different than other people because as soon as you have been there so to say very close to heaven you can come back and and forget about that no and you can't always will always have an impact in your life and yeah always like you want to look beyond you want to understand more than just like being in the system you really want to know why we are here what is our purpose and really going deep so yeah, I, I, people who have been there can really understand like how this is. And even as a child, very early getting confronted with the questions normal people ask when they're coming close to death, like when they are very yeah. old. But yeah, like you said you have been like you no know, 12, 12 years old and you know, very young and yeah. already coming into this kind of awakening process. Exactly. And but when I first when this first happened to me, I thought that everyone asked those kinds of questions. I really did. I thought that, so, you know, I would share what I knew with lots of kids in school and what I was discovering. And I realized that they all were rolling their head because they were too busy trying to fit in with other kids, figure out how to survive high school, you know, all of these things. And even the question came, why why would I be born this curious? And sometime later, later in life, I thought to myself, as I started to understand the laws of physics that govern our lifetimes and biophysics and astrophysics and all of these things, I started to think to myself, holy cow, you know, I, if I live this way, things are going to get incredibly expansive and there's not going to be boundaries to, that's why I always have this painting beside me, you know, it's like, there's not going to be boundaries. There's not, not going to be uh, limits to what I can play with. And in a way, I instantly, when I first realized what was available to me after a very interesting one-on-one -on -one, one with a client, well, in this case, two-on-one, -on because it was her husband, too, with a client who had migraines. I attracted a lot of people who had migraines because one of my near-death experiences involved having migraines for three years and just being unstoppably unwilling to have migraines the rest of my life. So I I just went about my business and uh, became a nutritionist specifically to heal myself. So in the process, um, I become very well known. I, I was on TV, I was, and it was mostly because I really had such 
a deep curiosity. And uh, that curiosity gave way to putting a lot of things together that other people hadn't. And so, and so as I was in that place, um, I knew that I would be, that I would be someone who wanted to build bridges to other people because what's the point of knowing all this stuff and thriving myself if other people couldn't know what I know? And I think there's a lot of other bridge builders and teachers like that. And I find in our work, we attract a lot of those teachers and bridge builders and and doctors and you know, all of those doctors, engineers, because I love the science of it. You know, there's a way to understand life that marries spirituality and science such that we can flourish forward instead of, um, instead of surviving every day. Do you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And how, how do you feel that people were open to yeah, come into your world and understand what you could see? Or was it more that they said, oh, you're kind of woo-woo, this is not real, you're making this up? Like, there are kind of these two poles, perhaps. That yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, I struggled with that. I Here's what I struggled with. I struggled with the language because... Um, with that woman who had migraines, um, I was sitting in front of her and all of a sudden I could see what it I had this special way of um, going through people's histories where it would take the entire lineage of everything stressful and disturbing that happened to them and then looking at all the health issues that they had had. And at that point, there was no epigenetics or psycho neuroimmunology at least it wasn't very popular this is 25 years ago and i was uh i was really fascinated by the correlation and she rec she represented a tipping point because in being in front of her with her husband who wanted to save her life she had a brain tumor and i looked at her and i knew instantly She made a choice around five, seven years old, somewhere in that range. And the choice was to have incredible disdain for her uh, her biological mother, who was an addict and gave her up to this extraordinarily amazing family. And she, the poison of that disdain, I could see that it had affected her entire body. And it was housed in a tumor in her brain. The result was this tumor in her brain. And I could see it and I could feel it. And she hadn't told me about it. Um, I said, did something happen? She said, yeah, my biological mother gave me up. I said, did you go to an amazing family? She said, yes. I said, I can see that all of creation, literally, you know, infinite wisdom itself uh, answered your prayer. Um, by sending you to a family where you could have all the love that you wanted. And she said, yes, that was very nice in a very curt voice. She said, but, you know, my real mother gave me up, didn't fight for her life, didn't take care of herself. And she, you could feel the vitriol. And um, and I could see it literally as she's talking. It's lighting up a, that that tumor in her brain. And I thought to myself, I said, are you willing to switch this? She goes, no, because I'm right. And I thought, you're not going to be around much longer. I didn't say it out loud, of course, um, because people can always change. There's always a chance that people can make a new choice. That's why, you know, uh, the idea of psychics is wonderful. Um, however, they can, people give their power away. So yes, it did look like she was going to pass away based on her current trajectory, but she had a choice to actually switch. She was in front of me. I could do my best to offer her or, or whatever else might happen to her. 
but in about uh, before a couple of months, her husband phoned me and said, that, you know, "Thank you, thing you did, but she has passed away." So it was awful. You are frozen. Yeah. Oh, am I? Yeah, so I can see that on your side, uh, the internet connection is on red. Hey, my dear, that uh, my computer for some reason switched to an extension. So we're on the right, we're on the right internet now. I don't know why it switched. So we should be fine now. Okay. So um, the last thing I heard was like uh, the husband called and told that uh, she passed away. So the husband called and said that she passed away and I got very sad. And at the same time, she came to me for migraines and uh, I had migraines. So you can imagine I, I had been working for years on the migraines. I barely had them anymore. But I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, maybe I have a brain tumor. You know? So then I studied brain tumors and I, you know, this is after so many miracles. And I got very scared. But then I, that night, I had, I had an experience that was so deep about the difference between the allowing of the answers, the lining up with the answers, and the passion of the question, and the idea of sort of making prayers, but not really having hope, or asking for, you know, something greater than you to fix you. And I realized that I, I didn't want to be fixed. And for me, that was really important because in trying to fix yourself, uh, the laws of physics say that if you want to fix yourself, you would always have to have something broken. Like if that's the game you want to play, you would always have to have something broken. And for some reason, my brain switched from trying to fix myself to wanting to truly understand myself. And that curiosity that night led to a series of wakened dreams that changed my life. I had this series of wakened dreams that had me seeing how we get sick. And it was very much aligned with that, with that, you know, that timeline analysis that I would do where I would parallel the stress and then the physical, you know, the, the, the medications, the when they got sick, the all this kind of stuff. And then I found a German doctor, as a matter of fact, called Dr. Hamer, who, um, who would correlate uh, brain scans uh, and, and, and lesions, he would call them, in the brain that correlate to um, stressful times in your life. And he was healing them by building bridges like I was doing. I was just doing it a little bit differently than him. And it was such scientific validation for what I was doing, which was, you know, basically building bridges um, to, to deeper truths than the truths that people were telling themselves. And I was shown all these truths in these wakened dreams that night where I was curious and I wanted to know it all. And I wanted to know what happened to that woman and I wanted to know what was going on with me, but from a state of curiosity, not from a state of I'm broken or I'm afraid of dying. Um, and um, I probably had about a week's worth. I'm not sure anymore, but between five days and seven days, maybe 10 of just waking dreams that were just showing me and showing me, showing me so weird. I was floating through the air. I mean, this is really weird stuff for an, I was an economist, Swanette. I was an economist and an accountant. I studied um, also um, social psychology and also biology because I was a nutritionist after I left my big corporate job when I got sick. 
So, you know, I'm like, I'm like, what is going on with these dreams? This is so weird. But I was, you know, floating in my dreams. I was opening doors with my mind. I was floating in the air with this really cool teacher who was writing on a floating chalkboard. I was with some of my witchy friends, you know, who I always thought were nuts because they told me they talked to angels. <laughs> we were all in this classroom. It was, in my mind, I, maybe for some people that's not weird, but let me tell you, it was weird, weird ass stuff. <laughs> so, so, and what I was shown is this, that the choices we make in life, in this lifetime or in other lifetimes, affect the entire future trajectory if we don't live in our presence and remain curious on the adventure about the deeper truths regarding the um, contrasting situations, the, the, the situations that cause us to confine ourselves or feel restriction in our body. Our body is our greatest messenger and it's our greatest guide. And um, it's so easy because it's right there. We're in it, you know. So, so as I realized that, my symptoms, I realized that consciousness, infinite wisdom, the laws of physics dictate that in entanglement for every problem or constriction or, or any issue that feels like that, there is always an equal and opposite freeing um, piece of deeper truth that we can line up with that would actually release that and that the body is catalyzing us towards a more present, refined, delicious, meaningful, uh, intimate, expansive life. I mean, if we are available for that, if we are willing, the skills to be able to live that way, no matter if you're an engineer or a stay-at-home mom, it does not matter. It's available to everyone. The universe does not, the universe is not picky. So, so, um, and something happened with the migraines that 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 uh, in the middle of a migraine where I literally got the reason why I had the migraines and uh, continued to pay that forward as well. So it was very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what you're sharing is uh, absolutely true. I can also yeah see this from my work that people show up with certain kind of symptoms and this is just like the end of the pie but if you go back into what is like the the origin the source of this situation like there have been situations that they have interpreted in a certain kind of way they made up their own stories and with that of course they have their emotions and like the body chemistry that works in the body and for that of course, you know, the body shows up with symptoms if you go into a loop over and over again and have the same experience you create and the same emotions. And for that, yeah, as you said, this lady had the migraine and then the tumor, but uh, it could have been like another area where she could have stored it. Like, you know, people get sick, they get, if they are in, in heart pain, for example, or they have problems with their stomach. So often you can see that if people tell you what is going on, what kind of emotions they had before. And this could be like what is really coming out of their present time, what they experience in this time. But also, you know, as you said, from an ancestral line, like through the epigenetics, for example. And even if you look a little bit wider, what comes through from the uh, Akashic Records, which are the library of the soul, even there can be connections that are still here present in this time. And oh, absolutely. Absolutely. In this case, you know, uh, you know, the beginning of my journey in, you know, it's so much bigger than it was, but I remember having my final migraine and I was lying in bed and it was the worst one. It was 
the worst migraine I'd ever had. I felt like my migraine, my head was just going to ex- literally explode, like, or implode or something. And uh, I'd already thrown up once. And I felt like I was going to again. And then I went, no, I remember those waking dreams. And I got on my knees on my bed and I curled up on a ball, but with my forehead on the bed and my knees underneath me. And I said, show me. And I had this feeling of taking my, I was just talking with one of my clients about this the other day. Um, I just remembered. Um, And I took myself out of my body. I took myself over um, to the side. And I didn't know that I could do that. So I took my consciousness off to the side and I was a witness to the, to the pain, to the stuff that was going on in my body. And instead of experiencing it, I was watching it. And I thought to myself, well, that's really interesting. I mean, that's really interesting that I can do this. In the meantime, I feel like I'm dying, you know, but I'm over here watching myself feeling like that. And then all of a sudden, I it was just so obvious to me. It wasn't a little voice. It was, it was just a knowing. I just knew. And I'm like, and I knew in my whole body that my ancestry on my father's side was incredibly perfectionistic because they were all engineers that, you know, if the bridge falls down, a lot of people die. So you have to get it right. And so I, my father was quite perfectionistic and he was very hard on me. And uh, so I became hard on myself and the pressure to get it right all the time continued, even though I wasn't living with my father, I had a husband and all of that. Um, The pressure to get it right was constantly in my brain. Get it right, get it right, get it right. If you don't, people will die even though I wasn't an engineer and my father wasn't around me. And in that moment, I realized it wasn't mine. It was a very simple act that I did. I gave it back to my father and his entire ancestry, not to be mean, but literally it's the opposite of being mean because the only way that any of them, uh, whether alive or dead, uh, could be responsible for shifting it is if they had it, if they had the whole thing, rather than it be sp- spread out in the ancestry to everyone. It's not mine. I didn't make that choice to try to get it right. Someone way back in time did. So I gave it back to whoever that person was, and I realized that I changed my entire ancestry all the way backwards, but now I changed my forward ancestry as well. And I could see it um, metaphysically. And, uh, and, it was the first time after three years that the migraine just disappeared. Now, the implications of that, first of all, it gave me one of the, it gave me, you know, last year I wrote a book and I realized that there were some tenets to thriving forward. And probably three of them are in the story I just shared. One of them is fixing yourself literally draws to you because of how physics works. It's magnetic. It draws to you experiences where you have to have things that you could perceive are broken so you can fix them and you can spend the rest of your life doing that. So that's one tenet. So how do you switch that? You you literally understand that you came here to be curious on the adventure. And if if in the laws of entanglement in physics, there's always a solution, you're either in survival trying to fix the problem, which you'll forever stay over here, or you're in thriving, like that picture, you're in thriving, and what you're doing is you're, you're actually in a way that I align with frequency, because in certain moods, you raise your frequency. So as you learn how to thrive, your frequency goes up as a default way of being. And in that frequency shift, you start to align with the solutions as, and the way of being is not fixing the brokenness. 
it's curious on the adventure, knowing that there's a solution. You're, and that snaps you out of it. So that would be one of the first tenets. Yeah, um, so let me go in there because I think yeah. this is very important. Like um, what I see is that somehow our, our whole society is taught to be fixed. And uh -huh. therefore, yeah, so they go to the doctor to get the, the medicine or surgery mm -hmm. or whatever uh, and no, get getting fixed. They are not really into their own empowerment of understanding that they are the ones that can make the decision either to become healthy and or to like you know what you said to, uh, to empower themselves or even to, to come into a thrive mode mm -hmm. uh, do you think that this is kind of by accident or by intention that we are taught that we are somehow broken and that we need to be fixed i think it's happened over time and i think you know I feel, and even, you know, one of the things about me that over time I've realized about that way of seeing people like my clients, um, I see holographically, I see now, you know, it's been 25 years, I've had, you know, tens of thousands of people worth of practice at just seeing how people are and the schisms energetically emotionally spiritually and 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 in reality and uh and i realized also that i could see whole paradigms and the world and organizations and the political structure and the economic structure and if i I'm just telling you a little bit about how I see it's called like holographic seeing. So I can see when I focus in, for instance, on a paradigm, like the question that you just asked, what I see is the paradigm, but I see it all the way backwards through all time and all the way forwards through all time and what actually happened. And what happened was that we... We used our ability to communicate and build bridges to build to, to polarize ourselves we started using money as a form of separation we pr started using power as a form of separation and we're in a time right now where people want their power back there is a, it's a time of great polarity where People can see that the emperor has no clothes. You know, that that fable where um, the king walks around with no clothes and nobody ever says anything until somebody just goes, hey, why hasn't anyone talked about the elephant in the room? This guy is not wearing any clothes. You know? So it's like the emperor has no clothes. In other words, these people have all the power. These people have all the money. These people aren't telling the truth. These people are using the media. These people, you know, I don't want to get too far into it, but the benefit of being in this time and being able to see everything for what it is, is that people are becoming not so enamored of it. They're being uh, sick of it. They're wanting something different for life. And that wanting, remember the wanting, the curious on the adventure over here, that wanting is, and that's what I love about these times, you know, um, that's where all of everyone who's curious about our work, I'm sure about yours as well, is coming from that place of, now, I don't want to give my power away to that allopathy that i'm broken give me the pill or give me the chiropractor again not that chiropractors are bad but literally the way you go to the chiropractor either to be fixed or curious on the adventure you know makes a huge difference because the energy of what happens to you will like you're going to be permanently healed or it's just going to lead to another problem you know what i mean so um and people have at this point we're being People are attempting to gaslight us, but I've also found uh, there's a whole world of people that realize that and are um, no longer, they're interested in awareness. They're interested in their presence. They're interested in knowing how to thrive over here. 
And, um, you know, I've spent the last 25 years really honing uh, how it is we get to this play like that operating system how do we operate from thriving so it's a it's it's a huge point in our history even listen dude even even people genius people like freud and like young and like adler all of these amazing psychotherapists uh, these researchers in human behavior they uh, Adler less, but the other two, Jung and Freud, were all about, hey, let's analyze people. Let's analyze how they how they think um, so that we can fix their thinking. You know, we're going to dive into the what's wrong really deeply. But the problem with that is you can end up at a therapist for 25 years, never actually getting over it. So... And and finding new things to fix all the time. The laws of physics dictate that that would be so. And then, you know, and then it's not to say that therapy is bad. It absolutely isn't. I went to a therapist um, trying to figure myself out for a long time. Um, You know, so it's the approach with which you go to someone. um, And certainly, and certainly I think uh, how we got here is we just fell asleep. We were used to being gaslit and manipulated and giving our power away to people that had more money, more power, more intelligence, more schooling, whatever. And we just kept going. And the great thing is, as you and I both know, that everyone has access to infinite wisdom. We have 75 trillion cells, that are communing through biophotons, through a fractal universe, through many different ways that, you know, that we are, we are connected. There isn't anyone that isn't. So, um, so the question now becomes, how do we live that way instead of how do we fix all the brokenness and the gaslighting? Right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, of course, no, it is, uh, like you said, everybody has the potential to access this field. And mm-hmm. it is about this moment of, I would say, again, this polarity on the one hand, people are so stuck and felt, feel like they are not in their own power and they, they don't have choices. But then on the other hand, people start to awaken because it is too much. And now they realize, okay, when I change my perspective and I really think that I'm an infinite being, then I can change everything inside of me and also in my outer reality. Yes. And one of the things, Swana, that is just striking me right now is this feeling that people have of, yeah, but isn't it too little too late? You know, isn't it too late with all of the wars and all of the authoritarianism and all of the stuff that's wanting our intention, you know, the illness, isn't it too late now? Isn't all the money with all the people that have all the money? Isn't, you know, can things really change? And I want to speak three I want to speak about three realities. One is it's a fractal universe. What that means is everything is a pattern of something else. You know, we're spiraling through space at 55,000 miles an hour. We also have DNA in our body that's the exact same spiral, exactly the same. And there are patterns and patterns and patterns and patterns. And if you change any pattern in yourself about the way you behave in life and take back your power, you, in in a pattern-based universe, mathematically, there's a guy named Mandelbrot that proved that if you change any aspect of the pattern of anything in nature, in the cosmos, and we're part of both of those things, we change that, it changes everything. Now imagine, because the patterns are copied over and over and over again, imagine I change me, you change you, 
we just change the entire universe. We're not, as Rumi said, we're not just a drop in the ocean. We're also the ocean in a drop. So if we can change ourselves, then we can change anything, even as an individual. So that's one thing. The second thing I want to share is that it's a biophotonic civilization. So human beings and plants and several other things give off photons, particles of light. Not in a woo way. Actually, there were several German scientists, well, two German scientists and several Russian scientists decades ago that realized that we give off photons, but we also have receptor site for photons. So we, and plants give off photons, and we receive the plants photons, and we receive each other's photons. And these photons travel around the earth at the speed of light, which is, which is seven times in a second. And our cells are receiving the communications of each other through light at the speed of seven times per second times 75 trillion cells. And that is not a little thing. That's a big thing. And what it means is that as you and I come into awareness and take our power back, and with all of the people that are being catalyzed to remember themselves, we're all being affected by each other, and we're all receiving each other's, let's call them upgraded, upgrades, or, or new understandings, let's call them about life, understanding how powerful we are. And so that's another sort of scientific basis. The last one is my favorite one, though. You can understand now why I got really interested in what is the thriving operating system, because if all these scientific things are true, which they are, um, I'm sure there are deeper understandings. I never profess to know the truth, because for me, once you open one door, it takes you down a wormhole to deeper and deeper truth, so we can't get so arrogant. But there's one other thing that I think is so ridiculously cool. There is a physicist named Nassim Harriman who I just appreciate so much. And what he's coming to terms with is that the, is that the, uh, that the entire universe is what we're in. So all of existence we are in. But in order for the equation that Einstein was working on to balance, i.e. balance the entire universe, to, to, for the mathematics of it all to work, the entire universe, the wormhole, the, the vacuum that is this creative vortex of holy cow infinity moving forward and out constantly, that spiral moving forward and out always. Um, in order for it to balance, the entire universe would also have to be at the center of our proton structure. So we, we have the wormhole of the entire universe. Like, I mean, isn't that just like, just what? The entire universe at the center of every atom in our body. We have 75 trillion cells times 100 billion atoms per cell. Just think about that for a second. That's how many cop fractals of the universe. Not a copy of the universe, not something like the universe, but the in, in a non-time-space reality, in a non-three-dimensional reality, it is actually possible to have the actual universe at the center of our atoms. That means that we can do anything. We're, if we knew how to thrive forward, we can do anything. So for me, these three scientific bases um, sent me down the wormhole of how do we thrive? How do we thrive? How, what, what are the laws? Show me the way. Cause, you know, I want to understand the, the essence, the spirit, the practicalities of this so I can assist, you know, companies, people, families, whomever to be able to expand forward and Resist nothing and play with everything. You get what I'm saying? So can everything change? Oh, my God. Everything can change. It's set up to change. We're built for change. We could do it. There's 8 billion people right now. Even if 1 billion of them understood all of this, things would change. You get what I'm saying?
Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is all about that we can understand not only the signs, but really feel this in our body. Like you mm -hmm. said, it is within us. It is in every, every cell. And if we connect with the universe and with the global consciousness, of course, we can radiate what we are about and we can bring out, bring in our tribe as well so that we are empowered being together and not feeling alone in this yeah, crazy, chaotic times at the moment. Yes. And, yeah. So it, I think it's all about coming back to real, true connections to understand who are in our fractal, who are in our tribe, so that we can thrive together and really find our soul family or however you want to call that. And yeah. Yes, support each other as well. And different soul families can, here's the thing, it doesn't mean there's no contrast. See, one of the things that's so funny is it, I had this discussion with someone yesterday. I can't remember why I was having this discussion, but we had this discussion yesterday about going round in circles. And I'm like, we aren't built to go round in circles. We're built to go forward and out. We're built to actually go in a spiral. It might look like a circle, but we're not, And how do we go in a spiral? Well, how an asteroid gets sent in a new direction is it hits another asteroid. You know, we're built to, maybe my soul family talks to your soul family, and there's a little bit of contrast there, but together, because of the contrast, we come to a deeper understanding or a deeper truth. That's wonderful. It's not about actually having no contrast. We are creators. We're in a creative universe. We were born to create. You understand? And so this is this is why we're here. And so it's an amazing time to be live with all of this contrast. If you're interested in lining up with the solutions, if you're interested in understanding that thriving operating system where you become a master at lining up with all of the solutions that in the law of entanglement must have been created. So, 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 you know, it's, it's about finding your tribe and finding a home tree and at the same time understanding that life is about creating going forward because if you were just around people that agreed with you all the time, you'd be going round in circles. We need contrast in order to actually be able to thrive moving forward in the spiral of our evolution and the more in our presence the more in our presence we are, you know, that's that second, you know, I talked about the first um, law of thriving. The second law of thriving is there's always an answer. There's always an answer. The contrast is necessary and the contrast creates an answer. Are you interested in beating everyone up so you can feel comfortable or trying to get everyone to see it your way? Are you interested in an actual solution that actually works for everybody. That's sort of a Buckminster Fuller um, concept. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think there is not one truth. There are perspectives on, yeah, or explanations about what we can see or what we can, oh, can oh, realize. So but yeah, there is, and I, I think it, even if we have discussions and different perspectives, there's no need to come to one solution, to one truth, but we mm -hmm. can still thrive in our own way. Absolutely. Yes, 100%. There are, I love different cultures. I've traveled the world like probably twice now, the entire globe. Oh my gosh, it's so fun. It's so interesting. It's so beautiful. I remember leaving Thailand and I told our bus driver for the five days because we, we went to um, an elephant retreat. I love elephants. You can see my picture over there, my uh, statue of an elephant over there. Um, I love elephants. I just have such a connection with them. But this man was so gracious and, credi and incredible and really helped us to understand Thai culture so deeply. And I told him when I left, you make me want to be a better person and with tears in my eyes. And that's how new cultures are to me. There's just a, there's such a richness and a beauty and so much in the differences but again, if you're leaning into it from surviving, you don't want anyone to, sh you know, shake your snow globe. You want all the snow to stay on the bottom of the snow globe. You know, 
<laughs> and, and just like, no, you know, whereas how to live is you want someone to shake the snow globe so you can catch the snowflakes with your tongue, you know. So and how many different ways can you catch the snowflakes? You know, and that's but that takes skill. It really that you do have to learn to live that way, because as you said earlier, most people are not living that way. They're not living that way. Yeah. And as you just said, it's about being in the present moment. I think this is also uh, massive at the moment that people are somewhere in their past thinking if I would have done something different, then my present would be different. And or they are already in the future thinking about what will be tomorrow or next week. But they are not mm -hmm. with all the senses in the present moment. So even if like a solution would, would show up, like a big synchronicity right in front of you, they will not get it because it's important to be, be here, to be clear and in the present moment, to, to really yeah, feel and sense what is showing up and leading you a certain mm -hmm. way. Yes, well, it's also one of the one of the the th that third law is you have to be at the frequency of the solution. So, in other words, being really responsible for your frequency. Last night with my husband, he um, he got a, an upsetting um, text from someone that's really important to him, and. I noticed myself worrying about him or carrying him or trying to make him feel better. And then I realized, no, that does not help. And I also realized that the only thing that helps is keeping myself in a place emotionally. And, and let me tell you, this takes some practice. And it's not that I'm staying in one place in a circle emotionally. I'm constantly looking, not as work. It's my joy to feel more connected to consciousness and more connected to you and other people and everyone that I love more in life, more and more. I, I, that is my pleasure. That is my joy. That is, adds the richness. It's so yummy. But when you live at a frequency where you understand how everything works and you embody that, you know, it, it's literally why I called one of our programs embodiment, because if we can embody an, a certain energetic state of being and then keep understanding how to deepen that state of grace and reverence for life and uh, love of finding solutions, Imagine not getting irritated every time a solution doesn't come. You actually get more curious. And that, like these are all beingness shifts, but everything is magnetic. So even if we were in our presence, but we were a little bit grumpy, or we were frustrated, or we we judged that we didn't get enough sleep last night, when in actuality the the energy of the entire universe is available to you through your cells, whether you got sleep or not. And so the point is this, that we have the capacity through conscious thought and through people around us that can help us to get to a different place and to permanently shift our default frequency. It is a magnetic universe. And so last night, instead of carrying my husband i just watched a really great special on leadership on netflix you know and and enjoyed it thoroughly and instead of sleeping next to my husband is in his upset we have a deal where i'm we're so committed to our frequency that i just went upstairs and slept in our guest bedroom and i i loved it it was very snuggly you know just having it matter so much for myself, but also actually for my husband, you know, that this is, this is really what matters. So, so it's important to be practical about it and understand the laws, you know, presence, yes, but in that spiral, constantly understanding how to be more graced by the joy and the love and the 
the beauty that is in this universe, you know. So I deliberately last night also went outside. The, the sky was clear, and where I live, there are no lights. So I could see the entire Milky Way. And uh, I just sat there. I just, I thought, why isn't everybody else outside looking at this right now? This is extraordinary. I mean, this is unbelievable. <laughs> you know, it's really, wow, you know? And so look at where we are. I felt like the, uh, what is it, the, the telescope that was, you know, <laughs> like, holy cats and cows. So anyways, yeah. Yeah, wow, this sounds beautiful. And I do this sometimes as well. I go out, I'm on Madeira Island, a tiny island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And we have, have some areas here where also there is uh, no light because no, we are up in the mountains, for example. And you can see like the whole universe, so to say. And just being there, sitting there and connecting to, to this yeah, amazing energy for me. This is like wow. But I also need to say that I'm a projector, so I'm kind of uh, having this already inside of me. This kind of being alone and being connected. <laughs> yeah, which is which is wonderful. I I I love that. I love that you're a projector in human design. That's super fun. That's a it's a super unique way of being. Yeah, it is absolutely. So you just chat a little bit about um, you have a program and you have a book or you have several books. And so yes, yeah, I I have uh, I have I have about ten books. I kind of lost count. That uh, either I have uh, contributed to one of them was called the Second Wave um, by Carrie Hummingbird, uh, and uh, so pretty interesting book, but. Uh, Yeah, I even went so far when I was a nutritionist to create the ultimate holistic uh, cookbook. So <laughs> it spans a whole bunch of things. But the most recent book I did was called Unstuck, The Physics of Getting Out of Your Own Way, which really should be the physics of getting out of the entire universe's way <laughs> if it was more accurate. But people understand getting out of your own way. Since we are the universe, it's still accurate. So, um, but uh, but yeah. So, my dear, yes, I I uh, I have that book. It's on Amazon. I really love the Audible though because then I read it and I added all sorts of extra things to it. And I that's where all of those five laws are. Um, also, there's a workshop we do called Embodiment. We do it three times a year. I would say that it's the divine feminine's answer to, I mean, we were, we've been doing a lot of the work that I assume Joe Dispenza is doing from what I hear. I've never done his workshop, but um, this is the divine feminine answer. Embodiment is all about jumping spirals, like literally going from one spiral to the next, um, making quantum leaps in life and embodying the operating system for thriving. And of course, we're on Facebook at thewideawakening.com, um, or sorry, at facebook.com forward slash wide awakening. And you can follow us there or come to something called the TWA Playground. And I'm on there all the time. But the biggest thing I want to share about how to get in contact is honestly, people can get 30 days free of our community of unicorns <laughs> that are just not willing to survive anymore. And they can go to the wideawakening.com forward slash 30 days and just get a month of that community free and actually do the program, get out of your way at no charge and the thriving operating system. So it's like, it's all in there and I'm in there and I'm answering questions and we have a monthly call. So it's great. Yeah, wow. Thank you for sharing this. And of course, I will put all um, the links in the show notes so that it is easy for people. Just go there, click and yeah, so they can come into your world and start thriving and uh, being empowered and really yeah, creating their own dream life and making the change in the world that is so necessary. Oh, thanks, beautiful. That's great. And I just, I have to say, It is so wonderful to come together 
with um, people like you who are part of building bridges to that evolution in humanity. And I'm, I'm so appreciative of you having the courage to play your part. I know for you it's just natural to be that way. But for most people, it isn't natural, and the rest of the world doesn't necessarily have a lot of agreement about living so in flow. But I'm I'm just deeply appreciative of you, Swanette, for being that way. Yeah, so thank you so much for for sharing this as well, and yeah, thank you for your appreciation. And I can only give this back to you because, as I said, <laughs> it, it's like we, we are in this amazing connection right from the first moment on and i i'm sure we could speak for hours and days and and years and we have so much to share and to think about and yeah i could open a lot of other topics already uh speaking with you but for now uh i would say uh yeah thank you for being my guest and uh hope to see you soon and speak with you soon again Let's please, Swinette, you have a wonderful rest of your day and just lots of gratitude to all of your listeners. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening or watching my podcast, Holistic Creators. If you want to know more about how I can help and support you, have a look at my website, spiritualchangemaker.com. You can also join my Facebook group, Spiritual Changemakers Community. Stay tuned for the next episode by subscribing to this channel and you also can check the previous episodes.